thank you very much, Dr. Arad. I think there's plenty of food for thought, and I'm sure there'll be questions and discussions afterwards. The issues that you dealt with were not on the surface of the elections. There wasn't a debate about a Palestinian state during the course of the elections. There was not really a debate about, there was a debate about uh, process or about tactics, specifically the uh, speech of the prime minister in, in Congress to some degree, but not about substance. On a lot of these issues, there's an Israeli consensus, 60, 70 percent, and reasonably deep public opinion polls, not the ones that are done instantly, <coughs> show that that is relatively continuous. Israelis live with the complexities, the difficulties in the balance that takes place, and are very aware of the issues that you didn't mention, but I know that are always very important to the work that you do, and that is the importance of maintaining deterrence, of taking risks, but within the ability to deter what could be turned into a very uh, dangerous situation, particularly given the region, the status of the region now. And that was certainly in the backs of the minds of many Israelis, and it to some degree came out in some of the videos and some of the uh, election activities. What was on the forefront were largely economic issues. A lot of discussion about housing, difficulties that young people have in finding affordable housing, on the gap between rich and poor, on income distribution, on what to do with all the natural gas and exports and many other issues like that. On that, I would say, I'm, getting, I'm being careful here because our next speaker, Professor Zobelfarb, is an expert and I'm not, but I would say on that, there is less of a consensus. That is the substance of the debate in many ways. By the way, my comment about national independence was more in reference to the activities of groups like V15 and a million hands and many other groups that were trying to organize and change the uh, positions of the significant part of the Israeli electorate that were funded from the outside. And that led to uh, well, friction. Jan, we should welcome funding from the outside as, as long as it is fair and given to both sides. And as long as it is within and the... The more the better. Uh, well, you and I will have this discussion later. I was going to add, add about the fact that organizations outside of the Israeli legal framework, not registered. But that's, my point is that these issues did create a lot of discussion in Israel. The formation of the government, the, minute, the division of the ministries, and most importantly, the policies that are eventually implemented are central in these areas, in the issues of economic distribution, the, the issues of... Uh, cost of living, housing, land distribution, all those other areas. And I can think of nobody better to give us an assessment of that, of those issues, both in the terms of the electoral framework and then what the options exist, what's real and what's imaginary, than Professor Ben Sion Zilbofarb. He ranges, he has, his background covers the full range of both academic and professional experience. And I have to say that I find, although I've only taught for a long time at Bar Ilan, I've had visiting you know, lectures and lectureships and professorships elsewhere. But I think at Bar Ilan we value more the mix between both the academic theoretical aspects, including in your own career, and the hands-on pragmatic, having to turn those into real policy issues. And Professor Zobelfarb has done both in a very distinguished career. Again, I will not read all of his accomplishments and all of his activities, but he's certainly well known to anybody that deals with Israeli, both academic, economic activity, research, publications, training of students, but also in terms of his own role as the Director General of the Ministry of Finance and having to actually deal with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's my pleasure now to invite Professor Zilberfarb to present these issues. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be here and to talk with you about the Israeli economy. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was hoping that the, uh, I'll talk before the elections because I read the economic platforms of the different parties. And at that point, I was sure that after the elections, we're going to be in heaven. <laughs> no poverty, no problems, everything is solved. But uh, reality, we have to face reality. Uh, 
I was hoping also that I'll have the opportunity to show you some slides, but uh, apparently not, so it will be hard to transmit figures and diagrams uh, only by heart, but I'll try to do that. Let me start with a few facts about the Israeli economy, especially for those of you who read the, the uh, Hebrew uh, newspapers before the elections and reading the headlines in some newspapers realize that this is a terrible economic place to live in, all kind of problems. Uh, so just, you know, two, se two, two minutes uh, about the Israeli economy in recent years. Uh, the Israeli economy grew at about 5% per year uh, until about uh, three years ago, which is a very impressive growth rate double as much as the OECD countries. In the last uh, three years, the growth of the economy declined from 5% uh, to 3, 3.5% per year. This is still very impressive by any international comparison. Uh, and I must say that the decline was not due to any mistakes in economic policy, but largely the result of uh, external factors. The main one is obviously what's happened worldwide, the uh, world recession. Uh, as you know, or may, may not, uh, Israel exports about 40% 40, 40 of GDP, close to 40% of GDP is exported. So exports account for a major portion of our economic activity. And when there is a slowdown in economic in the worldwide markets, this affects about 40% of our production. If you talk about industry, more than half is, import, is exported. So this was the main reason for the slowdown. And until the world is not going to recover, I think we are stuck with this level of growth in the Israeli economy in the years to come. In all other aspects, Anyone who follows what's happening in the Israeli economy over the last 10, 20, uh, 25 years, improvements on every uh, front. A debt of the government and local governments, which was about 90% uh, of GDP 10 years ago, declined to 67%. Uh, the main change, I think, for those of you who followed the Israeli economy for many years is what happened in the balance of payments. I'm teaching uh, the economics of the Israeli economy for, for the last 40 years. And one of the chronic problems of the Israeli economy was the deficit in the balance of payment. And then, since 2002, Israel has a positive balance of payment, which means we export more than we import. And this is a major change. The surplus in the balance of payment in last year was about 3% of GDP. This is a major change, a, a drastic one. And the last thing I want to emphasize if we're looking at the, at the Israeli economy, is the unemployment rate. Uh, many of you come from Europe where unemployment is, is a major problem. Unemployment rate, the last figure that was released a couple of weeks ago, 5%. What is more impressive, impressive is that this decline in the unemployment rate is at a time when the labor force participation increased and increased dramatically. It means that more and more people are flowing as a percentage of the population in the relevant ages is flowing into the labor market. So you have more people flowing into the labor market and at the same time you decrease the unemployment rate. By the way, the increase, and this is a very impressive increase, in the participation rate in the labor force, which means that more and more people are joining the labor force, is the result of an act that uh, the Ministry of Finance at that time, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, uh, did, and this was done around 2004. It's the major cut in child allowances, 
which falls two sectors in the economy, uh, the ultra-Orthodox and the Arabs, to uh, rely less on child support, and for no other choice, they had to join the labor force. And this is a major change. The title, I think, of the uh, of this meeting is, let me see. Stay the same or more the same. The Israeli elections, turning point or more of the same. So if you're looking just for the answer, I can sit down. The answer is no turning point. The last turning point in the Israeli economy was 1985, where the Israeli, econ the Israeli government adopted the anti-inflation program at that point of time. The annual inflation rate in Israel was 440% a year. And in June of 1985, uh, the Israeli government adopted an anti-inflation policy, and this was a real turning point in the Israeli economy. And if I have to sum up what happened since then, is budget dis discipline, no printing of money, it's not allowed by law. Um, and ever since, there is improvement on all macroeconomic aspects of the Israeli economy. And there is no difference. If you look at the policies of the different governments in Israel, since 1985, there is no difference if the Likud was in power, if the Labour Party was in power, if there was a national unity government in power. They all pursue more or less the same policies. So what? Can we expect after the elections? Assuming that the coalition will be formed and assuming that uh, right now what seems likely that Mr. Kahlon will be in, uh, in power. Well, the main challenge he faces is not what he was talking about in the election. The first challenge he has is to pass a budget. The economy is not operating with a budget for in the year 2015. What's happening is the continuation of 2014, and the, the original plan was to increase the government budget by 4% this year, and this is not done, because by law, you, if you don't have a new budget passed by the Knesset, you continue uh, the previous budget. Basically, more or less, who controls it is, is doing it the Ministry of Finance, and, and, and this is his main problem. The first task he has is to pass a budget. Now here is a dilemma. Is he going to pass a budget for the year 15, or, here he, or is he going to pass a budget for two years, 15 and 16? We had the same problem a few years ago, and the Knesset at that time decided, or the government decided, to pass a budget for two years. The problem is if you, uh, let's assume you form the coalition in, in April, and you start negotiating about the budget of 15, by the end you finish these negotiations. It's not, this is not an easy task. It's going to be June, July, and June, July is usually the time when you prepare the budget for the following year. So my assumption is that at the very end, it will be a, a budget for two years. But this is the main, the, the first task that he has in, on, on his table. The other thing is, uh, if I, what I wrote down here is managing expectations. Expectations are high, as the title of this meeting uh, is saying. Is there going to be a turning point? A lot of promises, promises, promises. What out of these promises can be fulfilled and what not? Uh, I would start with housing. Every party promised all kind of solution to the housing problem. And this is a problem. From the year 2006 till 2014, Prices of housing increase by 50% in real terms. It means 50% above the increase in the consumer price index. Uh, and this is a problem. 
However, as you can imagine, without being an expert in the housing market, it's a problem of demand and supply. And the solution is not to encourage demand, as the former Ministry of Finance tried to do, and fortunately failed, but to increase the supply. And increasing the supply requires a lot of activities. But no matter what you do, it's a process of few years. Permits to build, bureaucracy is terrible. Permits to build can take up to four years. Assuming you're very successful in cut bureaucracy, let's say from four years to one year. The construction itself takes two years. So if you talk about a real solution, it's going to be two, three years before you realize any major change. So this is one of the promises that I think whoever is in power is going to realize that it takes more time than he thought. Uh, I want to move to a, another area. Another area uh, which is close to what I'm dealing with is the banking industry. You read a lot about what uh, Mr. Cahlon did in the uh, cellular industry when prices went down. And one of these major uh, things on his platform was, I'm going to introduce competition in the banking industry. I'm going to break all kinds of banking groups, and so on and so forth. Uh, let me say very briefly, let's talk about four things in his reform. One, major th one thing that he introduced, he said, I'm going to introduce internet banking. Internet banking. Uh, is going to cause the banks in, to be more competitive. It will offer the public cheaper ways to uh, run his uh, banking accounts. Well, he's going to find a surprise here. First of all, or if I put it under a general title, it's a question of competition versus stability. In all the reforms he is going to do in the he wants to do in the banking industry, he has a partner, whether he knows it or not. And the partner is the Bank of Israel. The Bank of Israel is very much concerned with the stability of the banking industry. One of the major achievements of the Israeli economy is that in spite of the uh, collapse of banks, major crisis in worldwide markets, in financial markets, the Israeli economy and the Israeli banking industry remained very solid. There were no problems in the Israeli banking industry. And the real issue is competition versus stability. Where the Bank of Israel is very much concerned with stability, all those people who want to introduce more competition, obviously there is a trade-off. And so uh, within the bank, if you want to establish a new bank in Israel, there is requirements for capital, at least $75 million. You have to invest in computer systems, another $30 million. So in order to start a new bank in Israel, you need at least $100 million. Uh, who is going to do that? The banking industry is under attack. The public is not sympathetic to the banking industry. Who wants to do that? And if you think about new entrance to the market, the two largest banks, Bank Apoalim and Bank Lumi, are going to introduce their own internet bank in a few months. They're working on it. And since they have the infrastructure, they have the money, any new entrant is going to face a very, very hard competition. So here is one step that was offered. I don't think that's going to make much effect. The other thing that the new Ministry of Finance, Minister of Finance may be successful in doing is credit scoring. In many of those, your countries, credit scoring is uh, prevalent, but not in Israel. One of the things that gives banks power is that they know the customers. They know his in history. They know his, if he pays on time, if he doesn't pay on time. 
And this makes, very, it makes it very difficult to move from one bank to another. If we introduce credit scoring, then you can take your credit scoring to another bank. And if you're a good borrower, there is no problem in opening another account in another bank. This is one thing that was opposed, obviously, by the two largest banks. And I think in the current environment, I think it has a chance to be implemented. This is one change that has a chance. Uh, they were talking about breaking uh, banking groups. Only a small effect. I won't go into uh, the uh, details of that. And the last is introducing deposit insurance in Israel. Some of the very small banks in Israel offered a competitive rates for borrowers and for depositors. However, people are afraid to put the money there because these are very small banks. If we introduce a, a deposit insurance, this may have a large effect on the ability of people to deposit, make a, going to make things much more competitive. And this is another thing that uh, uh, is going to have, uh, in my opinion, uh, an effect in the banking industry. The last thing is, and the major one, and with this, I'll uh, conclude my uh, remarks. And this goes back to what I started with. Since 1985, the Israeli government is committed to fiscal discipline. Sometimes there is a, a lot of argument if the, if def, this, uh, the government deficit should be 3%, 2.5%, 2%, 3.5%. But it's all in the range of 3%, which is, as you know, it's uh, the Maastricht Agreement. 3% deficit is considered by international standards to be a reasonable deficit for the government. No one is offering to break this rule. And as I said before, no matter what the government is. So all the new programs that are going to be introduced have to fall within this discipline. And they are subject to the ability of the government to collect taxes. I'm saying collect taxes and not raising taxes. Because one of the things that uh, the prime minister uh, really aspired to see is a reduction in the tax burden. Uh, he, uh, he had a clear pattern on how taxes are going to decline. However, he had to abandon this. Uh, when the social protest started, this was one of the uh, achievements of the protest. But definitely, I don't see Prime Minister Netanyahu is giving hand or supporting a, a major increase in taxes. And without that, everyone, every prime, every minister of finance, has to live within the ability of the com of the uh, country to support all kinds of new reforms. And last thing is, the key to success of the finance minister is one, support of the prime minister. If they work in harmony, there is a chance to, chance to make some changes. No turning point, but some changes. Without it, there is no way the minister of finance can succeed. Thank you very much.